Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, GDoc Plus, a data science platform for precision medicine research. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We'd also like to acknowledge the C and EN Media Group for help with programming and promotion of this event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Suba Madhavan. Dr. Suba Madhavan is director of the Innovation Center for Biomedical Informatics at the Georgetown University Medical Center and associate professor of oncology. She is a world-class leader in data science, clinical informatics, and health IT, who is responsible for several biomedical informatics efforts, including the software development of the Georgetown Database of Cancer, GDOC, a resource for both researchers and clinicians to realize the goals of personalized medicine. And she co-directs the Lombardi Cancer Center's biostatistics and bioinformatics shared resource. If you would like more information about our speaker, please click on her photo image in the top right. The planners for this event have stated no relevant financial relationships. However, Dr. Kevin Davies did disclose that he is a scientific advisory board member for Pathway Genomics and is on the Speakers Bureau for Harry Walker Incorporated and that neither can constitute a conflict of interest. Please note that Dr. Madovan has indicated that she has no relevant financial relationships relative to this topic. I will now turn it over to Dr. Madhavan for her presentation. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, Labroots, for inviting me to um, speak about GDOC. Georgetown Database of Cancer. So over the next 40 to 45 minutes, I will be presenting the software platform that's intended for translational research and precision medicine research here at Georgetown University's Lombardi Cancer Center, um, as well as other collaborators who work with us on a number of projects. And then we will have about 10 to 15 minutes of a Q&A session uh, giving you an opportunity to ask questions um, and bring up points for discussions about the topic that I'm going to present to you today. So this platform, again, it's called GDOC, Georgetown Database of Cancer. We have been working on this translational research platform for over five years now uh, at Georgetown's Lombardi Cancer Center. This effort is funded by the National Cancer Institute, NHGRI, the Genome Institute at the NIH, the FDA, MCATS, and St. Baldrick's Foundation. The goals of the GDOC platform are listed here on this slide. Um, the primary purpose of this effort was to enable translational research by integrating patient characteristics and genotype information, genotypic data, um, in under one umbrella within this software platform to allow for unified access to this information. So really the primary goal is genotype phenotype integration. We also wanted to offer workflows in precision medicine, translational research, and population genetics to our end users. So when I say end users, our typical users are clinical researchers or basic scientists who are not computer programmers. So they really uh, need an application or a user interface where they could connect the genotype and phenotype data and ask interesting questions. So those are the target audience for this platform. 
We also wanted to take advantage of cloud computing and other big data technologies that are emerging to provide access to large scale genomic information through the GDOC platform. The GDOC platform uses our in-house architectural framework. We built this um, architectural framework at Georgetown University. It currently supports over 1,000 users um, and contains data from over 10,000 uh, patients or cell line information. The only criteria we use to select the data sets to load into GDOC is that that particular study or the data set must contain um, some kind of omics information. It could be genomic data, it could be transcriptomics or metabolomic information, but we also need some clinical information associated with that study. So that's our criteria for selecting studies to be loaded into the GDOC platform. As I mentioned, it provides support for uh, transcriptomics studies, miRNA expression, copy number variation, metabolomic data, and whole genome sequencing information. Um, it also contains uh, these large publicly available data collections, such as the 1,000 Genomes data sets, um, multi-omics data from the NCI60 profiling uh, data sets, and other um, cancer studies as well as non-cancer studies that are available within the portal. Uh, the system also supports private studies um, or data sets that our collaborators are working on. So we are able to process them and make them available through the GDOC platform. Uh, and eventually when the study gets published, the study can be made public within the GDOC portal. Um, it has a broad collection of analysis tools that are available uh, to our end users uh, to analyze and investigate the data sets that are present uh, within the system. It currently supports many research projects. Our primary focus when we started building this translational research platform um, was to support colon cancer and breast cancer studies. Those are two major focus areas at the Lombardi Cancer Center. Uh, we have now since expanded uh, the system to cover other types of cancers as well as non-cancer studies. So you can think of GDOC as a research data warehouse with um, a set of analysis tools that are available to analyze uh, the genotype phenotype information that's present within the platform. So I list here a number of other um, studies or uh, uh, disease types that are supported within, within GDOC. So the primary mission was to um, integrate best-in-class software tools that are available for a variety of bioinformatic methods. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we integrate the GDOC platform with pathway tools to do network analysis. Uh, we integrate it with imaging tools so users can explore MRI images. We have uh, next generation sequence uh, analysis tools that are primarily written in Bioconductor in R, and those are integrated within the GDOC platform as well. Uh, and other disease classification tools are available uh, within the GDOC platform to really allow for a single stop shop so the users um, do not need to go into other software platforms while they're exploring these data sets. So all these uh, tools are available and analysis methods are available within the GDOC platform um, for them to analyze uh, this data. We are currently also integrating with clinical platforms. Um, the EHR system that we use um, at Georgetown's Lombardi Cancer Center is called ARIA. Uh, it's from a company called Varian, and we are currently in the process of developing integration uh, with our EHR platform, uh, and also a clinical research platform which was developed out of Vanderbilt University uh, called REDCap. So again, the idea is uh, to integrate with best-in-class software uh, to allow for um, users to use this information uh, and analyze the data in the context of these tools. So in this slide here um, shows you an overview of the various features that are present within the GDOC system. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, you can see um, that the data sources can either be public data sources such as from the NCBI's GEO database, which is the gene expression database, um, or the EBI's Array Express. Um, we can also take data sets from our collaborators. Um, as I mentioned, you know, if the data sets are not publicly available, but the data sets are available through uh, a research consortium, 
uh, that we're part of, we are able to take data sets from our collaborators as well. Uh, and there are a number of um, analysis tools within the system um, to analyze uh, copy number data, next generation sequencing data, medical images, metabolomics, uh, tran and transcriptomics, and other uh, variant type of genomics information. Where um, we do not have bioinformatic pipelines, we develop our own uh, pipelines de novo, but uh, more often than not, there are other standardized bioinformatic pipelines that are available uh, that we have incorporated within um, the GDOC system. The data is stored in um, two different areas here. So when the data sets are large, such as large genomic projects, uh, we end up storing those data sets on the Amazon cloud. So we use the Amazon's S3 bucket, uh, which is part of the Amazon Web Services, to store the data. And all the analysis and the computes occur uh, in the EC2 clusters within Amazon Web Services. The data sets are not large, or if there is um, clinical information and PHI data about patients, we store them within our secure data center uh, which is located in Laurel, Maryland. So depending on the project and depending on the security needs of the project, we are able to switch the storage location to either our lo local data center <coughs> or the Amazon cloud. So once the data is populated within the GDOC system, there are a number of tools that are available to explore these data sets. Uh, and we also link out to other uh, public databases so that the users um, could annotate the data sets um, that they are exploring within GDOC with information that's present in other uh, databases. Uh, this is the URL for uh, the GDOC website. So it's gdoc.georgetown.edu. Uh, we have over 1,000 users. This slide is not updated. I apologize for that. So we have over 1,000 users in the system. Uh, and we have about 10,000 uh, patients or cell line data uh, within this uh, research data warehouse. So if you log into gdoc.doshon.edu and register, you will be able to explore the publicly available studies. So here is a quick review of the cloud computing architecture um, that is in place to support GDOC. Uh, this is, these are all AWS resources, so they are on demand. So we are able to uh, call upon these EC2 nodes as and when there is a need to do high throughput computes. Um, all the uh, large data sets are stored within the S3 bucket. So typically we're able to connect uh, with the genome sequencers. Um, so in this example, I mentioned in one of my previous slides that we obtain data from, com from complete genomics. Um, we were able to connect directly with Complete Genomics' S3 bucket so that the data gets moved uh, from uh, U.S. West Coast S3 bucket to the East Coast bucket, which was our bucket. Um, so essentially the data gets stored in, in the S3 buckets, and then the EC2 nodes are invoked um, for various analysis. Um, a lot of time and effort was spent in, in thinking about, you know, what sort of security infrastructure we need to put in place. Um, there's a virtual, there's a VPC connection between uh, the end users and the Amazon cloud, um, and there's authentication via uh, the VPC um, for users to connect to the Amazon cloud uh, cluster uh, to access these data sets. And so this is in the case of um, data sets when they're stored on the Amazon cloud. So in the case where they're actually stored in our local data center, uh, there's a different authentication authorization protocol that allows users into the system. So here is a quick overview of the kinds of computes that are available within the Amazon platform. Um, we have implemented these pipelines through uh, a system called Globus Genomics. This was developed by uh, Dr. Ian Foster's group at University of Chicago. Uh, we closely collaborated with them to develop these next generation sequencing data analysis pipelines. Um, so when the data sets, say from complete genomics or other provider or our own um, sequencing machines at Georgetown, uh, we then pre-process them using these bioinformatic pipelines uh, before they get loaded into uh, GDOC for analysis. So again, here is the, uh, the URL for the system. Uh, and users, uh, even before they log in, uh, can see the data sets 
can see uh, what types of data sets are available. Uh, there are muscular dystrophy studies, there are infectious diseases studies, and other types of cancer studies uh, that are available within the platform. And you can see this even before you log into the system. And there's a little link here up top on the right-hand side uh, to register within the system. And it takes just a few seconds if you click on register uh, and you create a username and password uh, and you can browse and analyze these data sets. Um, again, um, this is uh, just the launch pad. I will be going into more details of the various um, features within, within the system and show you a quick demo. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the GDOC platform and the architecture, uh, there's a paper we published in Neoplasia a few years ago that goes into more details about uh, the, uh, the architecture as well as the kinds of data that we load into the system. So let's take a look at um, how to navigate these data sets within GDOC. Um, so here's the front page. So even before you log in, you can explore these data sets uh, to understand what types of data sets are available uh, and, the, um, and, and depending on the research questions or the hypothesis that you would like to generate, you can select uh, a study of interest. So you log in here. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you can just click on register where the blue arrow shows uh, and you can quickly register to, to get into the platform. Uh, and once you log in, this is the view that you will see. Uh, it takes you to the GDOC launch pad uh, and there is a box here that says it all starts here. It'll help you. There's a wizard type interface that'll help you pick a study um, for your analysis within GDOC. So once you click on that, uh, it'll take you to this window. Uh, and there are three different types of workflows that are possible. Um, you can do precision medicine type analysis to look at individual patients. You can conduct translational research analysis where you can select a translational research study and conduct various bioinformatic analysis. Uh, you can also uh, do population genetics type of analysis. So for today's discussion, I'm going to focus on uh, translational research. And here I'm showing you uh, a brain tumor study, uh, which is the study that I uh, want to select. So once you click on, on brain tumor, it'll show you uh, the various types of studies that are available under uh, the brain tumor category. You can click on more to learn more about this study that we are going to choose today. It's called the Rembrandt study. It was um, started and funded by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and this data set is publicly available and published um, in a number of, uh, number of peer-reviewed journal articles. So that is the study that we're going to select um, for exploration within GDOC. So once you select the study, uh, it then provides you with a menu of options. So you could do, you could search the gene expression data or you could search the clinical data. The system is, uh, will provide you with options depending on the types of omics data that are available within the platform. So let's say the study had proteomics or metabolomics data sets, those will be listed here as well. So in this study, there is transcriptomics data and there is clinical information. Uh, and you could also invoke any of these analysis tools uh, to look at, uh, to analyze data within the study. So I selected on my previous screen, uh, that I want to explore the clinical data, and that takes me to this screen here. Uh, and you can use any of these menu options on the left-hand uh, panel uh, to further filter the data set. Uh, and here you can see these are the data elements that are already available as part of the study. So it's very study specific. So it will only show you those data elements that are available for you to filter the data by. Um, right now I've, I've chosen to look at the data by disease type. So recall that this is a brain tumor study. And here I have um, various types of brain tumors listed and the number of subjects that are present for each of those data types. So we have oligodendroglioma, 86 patients, astrocytoma, 170 patients, uh, and GBM, 261 patients. And let's say that I want to compare the gene expression profiles between uh, glioma, glioblastoma multiforme, which is the worst form of brain tumor, uh, with astrocytomas. Uh, and that's the workflow that I'm going to take you through. So you can click on uh, the, uh, the number here. Um, so basically on astrocytoma, we have 170 patients. And for GBM, we have 261 patients. 
uh, and I can save that list, I can save that clinical list as Astro or GBM, you can give it a custom name um, for this clinical list. And now my two lists are saved. So I've saved the astrocytoma group, I've saved the GBM group, and I'd like to do a group comparison uh, between these two groups using the gene expression data. So when I click on uh, group comparison, this screen shows up, uh, and I can select the groups that I have just saved. So as you can see up top, I'm selecting the astrocytomas as my baseline group and the GBMs as uh, my experimental group. Uh, and I want the p-value when I compare these to be at least 0 0.0001. So I'm, I'm really looking for significant hits. Uh, and I do want to do a multiple comparison adjustment corrections using FDR. Uh, and the data type that I want to select is gene expression data. These are all defaults that are available within the platform. As I mentioned in my introduction, the target audience for this group are clinical researchers or basic scientists. So we want to try and avoid, um, you know, writing code um, or any, any type of complex analysis. So a lot of defaults are available uh, to allow our end users to explore the data sets. Uh, and so that's the comparison we will do here. So once I run the group comparison, uh, it's available within the notifications tab. Uh, it'll tell me when the group comparison is complete. So all of these um, analysis are occurring um, in, in an analysis cluster that's running in the back end, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty quick. So this example that I showed you, it took a couple of seconds to run, uh, and this is the Affymetrix um, whole genome array um, for about 170 uh, astrocytomas and about 200 uh, GBM cases. So once you click on uh, the results of group comparison, you can now see uh, the various reporters or genes that are listed uh, that are different between the astrocytoma group and uh, the GBM group. It actually gives you a little um, indication here on the type of analysis that you conducted on this data set. Up top, it tells you that you compared astrocytoma and GBM. Uh, and these are the parameters that you had set up. Uh, and these are the results of group comparison, as, as you can see. Uh, and, and the blue links here indicate that you can click on them and uh, it'll take you to other uh, public databases if you wanted to learn more about uh, these genes. So you can then select these genes and you can save them either, either just as genes or you can save them as reporters. In the Affymetrix uh, array platform, you have multiple reporters that can measure the expression of a single gene. So if you decide to choose at a much more granular level, you could save the data by reporters. And then you could run uh, classification on the genes or reporters that you have saved. And those options are available under the study options. So I'm going to choose classification uh, here. So basically what we have done is we have taken the astrocytoma group and the GBM group. We saved the clinical uh, data set for each of them, the, pa the patient list. And then we ran a class comparison experiment to see which are the genes that are up or down regulated um, when you compare these two groups. So once I've done that, I'm now interested in seeing, based on this gene expression data, can I actually run a principal component analysis to classify uh, these patients? And that's this analysis. So you can choose the two groups that you want to run the classification on, and here are the results. So once you run it, you'll, it'll show you uh, a PCA plot, and you can see here the red dots are astrocytoma samples and the green dots here uh, are from glioblastoma. And you can see that there is a clear separation, although there are some astrocytoma patients uh, whose molecular profiles are beginning to look like uh, GBMs. So, so that could be indicative of you know, how the molecular biology is telling us more than what we can understand from, from pathology. Um, so maybe these astrocytomas have molecular profiles that are very similar to GBMs, thus giving us an indication of what sort of treatment planning we may have to do um, for these patients that are embedded within uh, the GBM group. So it's an exploratory analysis. You could also do uh, a survival analysis. You can run a Kaplan-Meier survival plot based on either gene expression data or clinical data on the study. If there were other data types available as part of that study, you could also run a KM plot based on that. So the Kaplan-Meier plot is going to allow me to um, see how the segregation is in terms of survival between these two groups. And so I, I can select, I can go back to, the, uh, to selecting the groups again. I've now selected the astrocytomas and GBMs, uh, and I'm interested in looking at overall survival in, in terms of months. 
right? So, and then immediately comes back the, the result for the KM plot. And I can see here uh, that the GBMs had poorer survival compared to the astrocytomas. The astrocytomas had longer survival uh, compared to the GBMs, and it also shows you a log rank p-value, which is pretty significant. This is a known fact. We know that the GBMs perform poorly uh, compared to other types of brain tumors. You can also run this uh, KM plot based on gene expression data. Um, so, so this was sort of just the tip of the iceberg, uh, the set of features. I encourage all of you who are listening to this lecture uh, to log into the GDOC system and register and try out some of these analyses uh, yourself. And there are a number of public data sets that are available uh, that you can play with. So the system, just to quickly summarize here, it allows to generate new hypotheses from existing data. We can perform in silico meta-analysis and compare disparate studies. Um, there's obviously added value in obtaining new insights from already published data sets. By reanalyzing the published data sets, uh, you might be able to glean new insights uh, into those studies. You know, something may not have been, a particular result may not have been called out in that publication, but you can explore further uh, from these published, uh, published data sets uh, and also aid in uh, new hypothesis generation for your own, own research if you, if you so choose to do so. So what I want to do in the next um, 15, 20 minutes is um, go through a um, scientific study uh, that we have used GDOC to analyze. So I've shown you a various set of features now. Uh, I want to now show you a scientific example of how the GDOC system can be used to answer a uh, very specific set of questions in stage two colorectal cancers. So just to set the stage here, uh, I want to briefly describe the study. Um, the, in stage two colon cancers, about 80% of these patients are cured after surgery. About 20% of them uh, end up having relapse after many years of treatment. So today, as it stands, early stage colon cancers after surgery, uh, everybody is hit with, with chemotherapy. If we could, on the day of surgery, predict which patients may recur versus not, then we could titrate the treatments based on that information. So on the day of surgery, we want to know which patients are going to relapse and which ones not. We basically want to know which are the just the 20% of the patients that we should treat and the rest that uh, we don't need to do anything because they're cured after surgery. So that was the primary hypothesis behind the study. Can we collect multi-omic data sets that can tell us which patients are going to relapse and which ones are not going to relapse? Um, so in this study, we collected uh, in, in 40 patients, we collected data on, uh, you know, tumor, on, on tumor DNA. Um, so we had adjacent normals. So the tumor tissue was collected and adjacent normals were collected and DNA was extracted from them. Uh, and the same was true for RNA data. RNA was extracted from tumor as well as normal tissue. Uh, we also collected serum and uh, urine um, and microRNA uh, RNAs were extracted from serum, and metabolites were extracted both from serum and, and urine. So the idea was um, to see if, if there could be a multi-omic profile that could help us predict which patients are going to relapse versus not. Uh, and we did the same for the relapsed cases, and we had um, a long-term follow-up at least five years. On many patients, we had uh, more than 10 years of follow-up, so we knew which patients had relapsed and which ones not. And we also had samples collected on the day of surgery. And we had over 100 uh, clinical attributes on these uh, patients. So here is the summary of our analysis. Let me show you the summary first, and then I'll walk you through the types of bioinformatic analysis we did on each of those data types. So different colors here indicate the different, different data types that we looked at within the study. The red here um, shows the, um, uh, the gene expression data. Uh, the green here shows the microRNA data. Uh, the blue uh, shows the copy number data. Uh, the pink here are serum metabolites, the positive channel serum metabolites, and the purple is negative channel serum metabolites. Uh, and the light blue shows urine metabolites, and the dark blue shows uh, urine metabolites negative channel. Um, so we started out with over 12,000 uh, markers in our feature matrix. So when we had measured each one of, using each one of these experiments, we had about 12,000 um, features. Uh, and using a number of bioinformatic approaches and data reduction approaches, uh, we ended up with a 31 panel marker set. So we ended up with a 31 panel prognostic set that was a combination of gene expression, microRNA, copy number, and metabolomics data 
and that could that with very high accuracy could predict which patients uh, were going to relapse versus not. So again, starting from about 12,000 um, uh, features, we ended up with 31 features that can very accurately predict which ones were uh, going to relapse and which patients were not going to relapse. So now let me walk you through each of the individual data types. So first I'm going to show you the gene expression data. Um, so what we did with the gene expression data uh, is the type of group comparison that we looked at in the example that I showed you when comparing astrocytomas to, to GBMs. Um, so we did a very similar analysis. So we took the relapse cases and the non-relapse cases and we compared the gene expression data sets and we came up with a list of genes that were either over or underexpressed between these two groups. And then did a pathway analysis. So if you recall uh, the GDOC diagram that I showed you, there are a number of pathway tools available within the GDOC system uh, to allow us to do this sort of network analysis. So what you're looking at here is an output of a network uh, analysis that um, is showing the up or down regulated genes when we compared the relapse and the non-relapse cases. What was interesting from this analysis was all these genes that you see highlighted in yellow uh, were all immune related genes. So it was already beginning to tell us a nice scientific story. So when we compared the relapse cases and the non-relapse cases, we were beginning to see uh, that the immune response genes such as chemokines, for example, CXC11, uh, we also had CCAMs, we had um, CXCL13 that were um, upregulated in, uh, in the relapse cases uh, compared to the non-relapse cases. So it was beginning to tell us uh, a very important immune-related story um, here. So we then looked at the copy number data uh, and um, using GDOC tools to analyze which are the regions that were either amplified or deleted uh, in the relapse cases compared to the non-relapse cases. And then when we did an enrichment analysis of uh, the regions, the cytobands that were either amplified or deleted, and we mapped them to what biological mechanisms those regions within the chromosomes may be involved in, uh, again, it started to point us towards an immune response story. Um, so there were uh, amplifications or deletions in the T cell activation. Uh, there were amplifications or deletions in the immune response uh, pathways. Uh, and this was, again, corroborating with our gene expression story. So that was the gene expression data. Uh, we then looked at uh, a number of variants that came out. So this is through the next-gen sequencing data set. So we employed an exome sequencing technique. So basically, we sequenced all the, uh, the human exomes in both the relapse as well as non-relapse cases. Uh, and this was a standardized pipeline that was used to process the next-generation sequencing data from the FASTQ files all the way through to VCF files. And also, the copy number uh, data sets can be analyzed using the exome data set. So here's, the, uh, here's a quick review of the pipeline that was used on Amazon Cloud to analyze this, this data. Um, and when we looked at the variants uh, that were present in the relapse cases, uh, meaning they were only present in the cases. So as you can see in this table, um, you see the column that says variants and number of cases. Uh, that had these variants, these variants were present only in the cases, not in the controls. So the cases were the relapse cases, uh, and the controls were the non-relapse. Non and these variants in these genes were present only in the relapse cases. And when we did a pathway enrichment analysis, lo and behold, again, we see T lymphocytes, P10 signaling, uh, and all kinds of uh, T cell and B cell signaling. So it's, it's actually, it was beginning to uh, corroborate the story that we were seeing with the gene expression data and really telling us a very interesting immune response story here. So the patients that um, were, were not showing relapse already had immune infiltration. So basically the immune cells were showing up in this tissue uh, in the, in the non-relapse cases. So in the patients that did not have relapse had very high infiltration uh, of immune cells. So that led us to um, uh, looking at the, um, do a pathological analysis. So basically look at the slides to see if we could say anything about um, immune infiltrates. And I will show you that in a second. Uh, but before that, I want to show you the metabolomics data. So here is the pipeline that um, was used for the, uh, the metabolomic analysis. So like I mentioned when I explained the system to you early on that, um, you know, where there were 
bioinformatic pipelines that were available. We adopted them. In the case of metabolomics, metabolomics is such a new field uh, that there weren't um, existing pipelines that we could use for this project. So we developed a, a, a pipeline uh, on our own, and this, this pipeline is already published. How do you go from uh, the MZXML data uh, from the mass spec all the way through to putative metabolites? Uh, we have built this pipeline, and it's published in the Journal of Metabolomics, uh, which you can you can look it up. But this is the uh, the core of that paper, uh, and uh, basically, you know, uh, the highlight of of this pipeline is that you know once the the mass by charge ratio, once the peaks are identified, uh, we then match those peaks to nine different databases uh, to identify the putative metabolites. So not just one or two databases. We wanted to see if there were other annotations. That are present in these uh, in these databases to uh, tell us what are these metabolites that are different between these two groups, um, and we then connect it to um, Stitch, another database that can link gene expression data uh, to metabolomic data. So we can ask all kinds of interesting questions. Uh, you know, we knew which are the genes that were over or underexpressed, uh, and using that information, we were uh, able to use the Stitch database to ask the question, were there any connections between the metabolites and gene expression data uh, that could further uh, tell us anything more about the immune response story uh, that we were, we were uh, trying to build. So here are some quick classification results. Uh, the panels here show uh, the metabolomics data. So this is for uh, biofluid-based markers. So I'm showing you here the ROC curves um, for uh, the, uh, the, the, the metabolomic experiment. Uh, we used a machine learning approach called SVM RFE. Uh, it's a support vector machine, uh, leave one out methodology. So basically what it does is um, it keeps reducing the number of features. Uh, until you end up with a set of features that can clearly separate the two groups. So if you left one more feature out, you will not be able to get that clear separation. So that's the, the machine learning approach. It's called support vector machines, which was used here. Uh, and we got very good um, AUC uh, curves on these. So basically, you know, close to 90% accuracy in classification uh, using just the biofluid-based based markers. Uh, the gene expression data was pretty good as well. Uh, but the, uh, the biofluid-based metabolomic markers gave us a much better classification. Here are the key metabolites that were involved. <clears throat> so recall uh, the immune response story that we were trying to build with the gene expression copy number data sets. Uh, and we were curious to see what the metabolomics data sets are telling us. And as you can see here, uh, the metabolites that were altered in the relapse cases compared to the non-relapse cases, again, ended up to be those that were mediated uh, in immune response. So we found 4-hydroxy-2-butanoic um, acid, uh, which, is mediate, which is involved in T and B cell mediated response. Uh, we also found other metabolites that were involved in other immune diseases, such as Crohn's disease, uh, and also carnitine metabolites, which are uh, known to be involved in immune or inflammatory uh, responses. So again, there was a corroboration uh, between all these data types uh, that, that, that we were seeing. So reproducibility in science is an active debate now, uh, and we're all looking at you know, how we could potentially reproduce results that were already published by other groups. Uh, and relating to that reproducibility discussion is corroboration. So can there be multiple data types that can give us similar results or, or point us in the right direction uh, in, terms of, in terms of discovery. So, so this uh, type of corroboration type experiments can be done in an in silico fashion within, uh, within the GDOC platform. So here is uh, the slide staining that I was talking about. Um, so we asked the question, are there infiltrating lymphocytes uh, in the non-relapse cases compared to the relapse cases? So the top panel that you see are the, the, the non-relapse, the ones that did not record. Uh, and then the bottom panel are the relapse cases. And as you can see uh, in slide section B, uh, that there are these brown spots. There are these little brown spots that you can see in panel B that clearly indicate that there were a much higher infiltration of, um, uh, of lymphocytes in the non-relapse group. So essentially, uh, there, is a, there is a protection uh, that's given to these tissue uh, because of this infiltration of, of lymphocytes. And this is a well-known fact. So we're not the first ones that are making this, hy this hypothesis. Uh, it's a known fact that in many cancers, we see infiltration of lymphocytes uh, that confer protection uh, against worse, worse outcomes. 
Um, now, here's an example of um, multi-omic data integration. We used uh, a system which was developed by the Institute of Systems Biology. Uh, it's called Regulome Explorer. We use this. This is called a circos plot. Many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the circos plot is a way to show a variety of genomic features on a circular plot like this. And you can actually map those features to individual chromosomes. So what you're, you're seeing here are the features that were mapped to chromosome 1, to chromosome 3, chromosome 4, and so on. And the different colors here show um, the, uh, the different types of uh, data that we can plot um, on, these, on these data sets. Um, and um, so, so the primary purpose of the circles plot is to see are there hubs within the genome, right? So if you actually look at this circles plot, you can see that there's a lot of activity in chromosome 3 and chromosome 4, for example, right? And chromosome 4 deletions are, are well known and well documented uh, in stage 2 colon cancer. So the primary purpose here is to see where are the major activities so that we could hone in uh, on those specific chromosomal regions. Okay, so um, once we look at the circles plot and we see what are the features that may be uh, involved, we can, uh, we can then, um, so what we are seeing here is just a network of those features, a combination of features that came out of the support vector machine analysis. Uh, and these different colors indicate the different data types. So the brown indicates um, here, these are metabolites. The blue ones are the gene expression data. You will recall the CXC11 and CXCL13 from the network diagram that we were looking at. The, uh, the red ones here uh, are also metabolites. The brown ones are urine metabolites, and the red ones are serum metabolites. You also see some microRNA data. So this is now really bringing together all of the data types that um, were filtered for those features that were different between uh, the, the relapse and the non-relapse cases, and you can see them in one, one view. Uh, and they are all inflammatory markers. So, so basically, you know, when you look up the biology of these individual markers, uh, it's clear that there is, a, there is an immune story that all of these da data points are, are trying to tell us. So this is the re end result, starting from about 12,000 features, applying these, uh, these bioinformatic approaches, we are able to arrive at the most informative uh, 31 features uh, that can tell us more about uh, the etiology and the biology of relapse in, in colon cancers. So we can further use the network modeling uh, diagram here to better understand what's going on across these data types. Um, and uh, when we plotted the 31 features, we actually see that there is a connection to a hub. This is um, FAS, uh, FAS hub, which is actually a TNF receptor protein. Uh, and all of these, uh, these genes and metabolites seem to be operating through this centralized hub. So, um, so using GDOC, you could sort of filter down uh, and arrive at the most informative features, but you could also do these sorts of network enrichment analysis uh, to understand better uh, the biology and begin to generate new hypotheses that you want to test in the lab or uh, design a new, new clinical assay. So what we've done so far is just a quick review. Uh, we looked at the Georgetown Database of Cancer. It's a publicly available database. Um, so I encourage you to go look at it, gdoc.georgetown.edu. You can register and look at the public data sets there. Um, and as data sets become public, there are some private data sets which are primarily for uh, the investigators that collaborate with us. Uh, once the data sets are published, we make them available in the public sandbox. You can explore them. You can analyze these data sets. Once you log in, you can um, start with the study. You start with the study, you pick a study, and you go through the analysis. Uh, we've shown you the sort of high-level features within GDOC. Uh, we've also taken one example of stage 2 colon cancers and have walked through uh, a variety of bioinformatic analysis that you can use uh, to filter down the results from big data into something that is uh, much more useful uh, and comprehensible to designing uh, your, your future experiments. Um, so that's what we have, we have done today. Uh, and if you're interested in understanding more about this research, uh, there's a paper we published on the stage 2 colon cancer study in Frontiers in Cancer Genetics. Um, and you can look up that study for a lot more details about uh, the, method the various methodologies that, uh, that were used. 
Um, so here are my coordinates in case there are any um, questions or feedback that you would like to reach reach out to me. Um, feel free to uh, email me at subha.madhavan at georgetown.edu. So I see that we are exactly at a 45 minute mark. Uh, we had planned for about 15 minutes of Q&A and I will stop there and we will take uh, questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the Q&A, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, were the metabolites measured untargeted, in parentheses, full change measures or quantitative targeted measures? quantitative targeted measures, quantitative targeted. Yes, um, so that's a good question. So the, uh, the metabolites were measured uh, untargeted. Uh, and we, um, once we did the first set of experiments using untargeted, this was all done using tandem mass spec analysis. Uh, and um, once we identified those select metabolites that were different between the, um, the relapse and the non-relapse cases, we did some targeted validation. So for the, um, the carnitine metabolites uh, and some of the others that I mentioned that were different between the relapse and non-relapse cases, we did um, targeted validation. And I believe uh, there's a related question about uh, controls, yes, in the urine metabolites, they were uh, normalized to, uh, to creatinine. So, so first, untargeted uh, tandem mass spec, and then um, identification of uh, the metabolites that were different in the relapse cases using the pipeline that I described. And then we did targeted validation um, for the, uh, the, the peaks that were different between the two groups. So let me know if you answered the second part of this three-part question. Were internal standards used? Three-part question. Were internal standards used? Yes. So we used we used internal standards on the metabolomics. I think um, you know. So we normalized it to uh, to other known uh, metabolites when the the untargeted metabolomics experiments were conducted, such as uh, to uh, to creatinine. Yes, internal control, controls were used. What were the units for urine metabolites measured? Normalized to creatinine? Metabolites measured. Normalized to creatinine? Yes, that's, that's correct. These were all M by Z values. Um, those are the raw, raw peaks that come out of the tandem mass spec assays. And um, once, the, um, once we use the, the uh, once the peak identification is done, uh, then we match them to the nine databases uh, and identify the putative uh, the putative metabolites. Uh, but the 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 units for the um, uh, the the, the output from the mass spec experiments are uh, just the M by Z values, basically. The mass by charge. Is there a steep learning curve to get to know GDOP for a non-computing scientist? To get to know GDOP for a non-computing scientist? So that's, that's an interesting question. So we've actually tried to target GDOP um, for a non-computer scientist. Uh, we have tried to target GDOC for non-computer non scientists. So the, and the, the users are typically uh, basic scientists or clinical researchers, uh, and that's our target, target audience. I would say that, you know, in the last few years that, um, you know, we've had people use the system, um, I, I highly recommend that they watch the tutorial videos. So there are a number of videos, uh, video tutorials that are available within GDOC. Uh, and, um, 
you can watch those and typically after watching those videos, uh, people are able to uh, use the various features within the platform. We also try to do some online training sessions. Uh, we typically do that for groups that are collaborating with us. So if there are uh, grant groups, you know, if a consortia grant is funded and a group of people want to use GDoc, we, we tend to do um, online training for those groups as well, very targeted to their use cases. Um, so I would say that the, the learning curve for the non-computer scientists is not huge, uh, but definitely taking the, the training, looking at the training videos is helpful. Another attendee asks, once, once registered, can we load up data sets to test run the system? Data sets to test run the system. Yeah, so currently the way the system is built, um, so the question is, you know, can you, can you load your own data sets to, uh, to test run the system? Um, once, so the way the system is built right now, um, you have to work with us to load the data. So there's no user interface uh, to upload your own data sets. Um, so there's a GDoc help email, which you can, you can email to gdoc-help at georgetown.edu. Uh, and a team will be assigned to work with you to load the data. Um, but we have to, uh, right now there's no mechanism um, for users to upload their own information uh, using the interface. But we, we are in the process of building that, uh, and, and that would enable uh, people to load the data themselves. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, with these data sets, the biggest challenge is mapping to standards and quality control. So we really want to control uh, the data that goes into the system so that there's high quality data that's available to our end users. Uh, and, you know, we, we tend to prioritize the studies based on um, the funding that's available to support that study. Um, so we typically tend to work with users who uh, are able to, you know, work with us on a, on a funded project. So we'd obviously prioritize the, their data sets uh, to get those data sets into the system. And, um, you know, we then map them to standards and, you know, do quality control on those data sets uh, before they get loaded into the, into the system. So right now there's no mechanism for users to directly upload their data using the user interface. Uh, but you can contact us and we can work with you to uh, load the data into the system. Okay, we, looks like we have time for one last question. So it is, if our data set is loaded up with your help, can that be kept private or will it become public? Can that be kept private or will it become public? Yeah, so the data set can be kept private. Uh, so there is, uh, there's a mechanism to keep the data sets public and, or keep the data sets private. Uh, when the, um, the experimentalists or the users want to load their data, uh, they can let the team know whether they want to keep this private or public. And we can keep it private um, until the information is published. Uh, and so that way, the data sets in the public private sandbox are only available to users uh, that have uploaded this data and the users that they have given access to. So you can have a restricted group of people uh, who can, you know, access these data sets and analyze the data sets uh, in the private, private confines of a workspace. And then once it's published, you, you can make it, make it public. So yes, the data set can be kept private within the system. I would like to once again thank Dr. Madhavan for her presentation. Do you have any final comments for us today? Presentation. Do you have any final comments for us today? No, thank you very much for this opportunity and a great Q&A session. Uh, I encourage everybody who is uh, either generating data or doing translational research to go check out the platform. We are always looking for uh, good input on how we could improve this platform. So any feedback there would be helpful. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening.
Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.